no, no. Fuck. Hello, fellow flat simmers. I'm Eric, and uh, this is uh, Tail Dragger 101. Um, this might sound a little bit uh, ambitious, maybe even pretentious, and uh, it is both. But I will be trying to share some of the knowledge I have about Tail Draggers. The reason I do this is because I love to fly this plane, this the Havland Beaver from uh, Thranda uh, with the Reality Expansion Pack, and uh, I've learned a lot from flying this thing. Um, so I thought I'd share some of it with you. Now a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm not a real pilot, so take everything I say with a grain of salt, do your own research and uh, talk with your instructor. However, uh, I'll try to do my best, based on the research and uh, about uh, almost a thousand hours in uh, tail draggers. Actually, a bit more, but uh, almost this uh, much in this plan. So, with that out of the way, let's get to it. Let's talk tail dragger. What does that mean? So, obviously, you can see the way the plane moves. It will be dragging its tail, right? So, before we get started with that, let's just review some basics with the tricycle airplane, since we have one here. So I'm going to run over here, have a look at this uh, beautiful Cessna sitting here. By the way, we're at uh, Willapa Harbor Airport, which is, uh, let's see here, two Sierra Niner in... Uh, West Washington, so the uh, Pacific Ocean is just, just outside here. So let's try to explain why a uh, normal tricycle airplane is uh, usually preferable in general um, for normal pilots, and why it's so easy to fly or land uh, or maneuver on the ground, to be precise. So. The basic is that the most of the weight of the plane is going to be somewhere around here. More or less, give or take. Let's say if most of the weight, well, the center of gravity is what you call it, let's say that it was here, what would happen then? Well, the plane would tip down. That, that would be bad. So the thing is that it's here, more or less. You have the pilot, maybe some luggage in the back, but of course you have the big engine in front. And what happens when you have this center of gravity around the middle of the plane like this? In front of this, which is the pivot point of the plane. So when you turn the plane, it pivots around the main wheels here. You steer it with a nose wheel, but it will pivot here. If you have the weight in front of it, it will, when you're moving, it will tend to stay in that uh, it will want to move in that direction. So it will drag the rest of the plane with it in that direction. Which means that the pivot point is safely uh, sitting there and you can steer it with a nose wheel. Or if you have a uh, castering nose wheel, you can steer it with uh, differential brakes like you do in a Ceres, for example. Another thing is that, and we will get back to this, is that the propeller is more or less um, kind of meeting the air directly like this like it is when you're flying you're level when you're on the ground this is going to be very important because as you know a tail dragon doesn't do that let's climb over to the uh, beaver and have a look at what it looks like. So, here's the pivot point for the beaver. CG is somewhere around here. 
and it, this will also move. Uh, but you can move the plane completely fine on the ground. Even with if the CG was here, it would be ridiculous, but it would be possible to move it unless you crush the tailwheel. So, with the pivot point here, and the main mass of the plane somewhere around here, when you're moving forwards, where does that mass want to go? It want to go that direction. So it wants to move past the pivot point. And this is why these planes are so unstable. Um, it wants to be the other way around. Which is why these planes are so clever. They are inherently stable. Whereas the beaver and all the other tail draggers are inherently unstable. This mass wants to move that in front of the plane. So, how do you counteract that? Well, you do it with the brakes, of course. But, and you can do it with uh, steering the tailwheel, if you're so lucky to have a steerable tailwheel. But this flap back here, the rudder, that's the big one. It's immensely important. But not to forget these. The ailerons. Do you know which one goes up and which one goes down when you want to make a turn? So let's just say you want to turn to the left. To do that, we want to have the left wing down and the right wing up. How do you do this? Well, of course you turn the um, stick or the uh, yoke to the left. This L1 comes up. This one goes down. Now why does it do that? The right L1 is now directing the airflow more downwards, which brings the wing up and a bunch of other aerodynamic stuff. Basically it force the wing up. This one on the left, if it does anything, it will maybe cancel a little bit of the left here. All of these things conspire the, uh, uh, the left wing to go down, the right one goes up. What you can probably see when I come here now, disregard the fact that it's sitting tail low now, uh, just imagine the wind coming this direction. You see that this part of the aileron sticking up here is not perhaps very visible to the air. It might hit some of it, but it's in general it's going to be hidden by the uh, by the wing. So this wing is, if it gets any difference, it's going to maybe lose a little bit of lift. However, this aileron. The wind is coming this direction. It's going to be forced down here and uh, if anything it will also follow through uh, from top here. So this wing has now a more of a curve to it. It's like a flap. It is like it's, it is a flap. It's just on the one side. What, do, what does this do? Let's have a look from the above here. This wing has maybe a little bit less uh, lift. This uh, L run, uh, this uh, the wing has a little bit more lift. The, the thing with this is that while it does that, it will create drag. This results in what is called adverse yaw. This lever out here, this huge wing, will be pushed backwards. So the, you want the plane to roll to the left, but the nose will be slightly want to go to the right because this wing goes down, or, or um, it's going to be pushed backwards because of the uh, extra drag here. For instance, the plane wants to ground loop and it wants to go this way. There are many things we can discuss here, uh, especially with the tailwheel, but uh, we'll get back to that. So. It wants to go to the left. You would think, of course, that right 
rudder will do the trick. Well, you'll be right. That will help. The wind coming here will pull the plane to the right. So that's one part that can help you. Right brake. There are things you shouldn't do with it, but it's yes, it's possible you can do that. However, what did I just say? If you turn the yoke of the stick to the left, you create uh, lift here and drag. You see how that can be useful when landing. You pull that wing back, you counteract that left turning tendency. So what I usually think when I just about to land, if I feel that the plane wants to go to one side, I'm going to turn the yoke in that direction because that will pull the other wing back. Of course, same goes the other way. Plane wants to ground loop that way. I turn into the ground loop, which creates more drag uh, and of course uh, also lift, but if you're already landed and pretty slow, that's not going to be a huge factor. But it's going to create drag. It's going to pull the wing back. The adverse you want can be your friend. And when I discovered this, I thought, okay, this is perfect. This is going to be very uh, happily useful for people flying in the real world, uh, where the aerodynamics follow the laws of physics. It works in x plane 2. It really does. And immediately when I started testing that out in the sim, I could feel the difference. Um, and uh, it's been uh, part of the repertoire ever since. So adverse yaw can be your friend. Stare into the ground loop. That will help you. An interesting demonstration I saw about how much manipulation and how small movements on the controls you need to do with the tail dragger is to try holding a large stick or a broom handle or something in your hand trying to balance it so if you have it completely level you might be able to hold it with a few movements but it, when it starts swaying away you have to really work on it to get it stable that's the tail dragger the tricycle plane is the opposite that's you just holding that stick. So when you move it, the stick moves after. You move it, the stick moves after. Much easier. The plane follows your directions, whereas the, the other way, you kind of have to react to the plane's movements and be basically on top of it. And that's one of the points I wanted to make as well, is that if you wait until the plane has done something uh, and wait and see what that is, then it's too late. Then you're reacting to something, uh, and it's probably uh, already beyond what you can do to fix it. So you have to be pro proactive. And uh, what I mean by that is you have to start doing something when you feel the plane doing something. And uh, it's almost like you're guessing, but after practicing a bit, you will get a feel for it. Uh, but the point is that you should be a step or two ahead of the plane. If you wait until you see what is going on, then you're already in the ground loop. You have to be uh, proactive. So uh, don't don't hesitate. Start doing something. So, uh, propeller. One thing to get straight first. When you look at a uh, normal American propeller airplane, they tend to spin uh, clockwise from seen from inside, counterclockwise seen from the front. And this is going to be very important. So let's have a look at, for example, this blade. With that direction of spinning, this blade is on its way up now. Have a look at that angle. So it's scooping air this way, right? So let's just say for purposes uh, of uh, you know, you know, uh, the air coming down here, it would hit the propeller and be shuffled that way. Not, not even that steeple. It will be hitting that and going this way. So it's not that much of a an airfoil. It is an airfoil, but it's it doesn't do much of job to uh, to produce uh, thrust here. Okay. This is the ascending blade. 
it's on its way up. Let's go to the other side. I don't have a blade directly out on that side, but have a look at this one. It's uh, past and on its way down here. Look at that angle. It's really biting the air here. And you can see that this one is also on its way to bite. What that means is that the blade that is coming down on the right side of the plane let's left side for us standing in front here is going to produce more bite in the air uh, than the one on the left what does that mean well it means that it has more thrust um, so let's have a look from above the plane here so the uh, propeller is uh, rotating clockwise from seen from inside the plane. Remember how the uh, blade on the right side here had more bite, a coarser pitch when it meets the air? It's going to have a lot more thrust, whereas the one on the left side is going to have less. This is simply because the plane is sitting tail low on the ground. As I showed you previously with the uh, Skyhawk, the propeller is uh, like, uh, let's just try to draw uh, the cowling of the airplane here. The propeller is um, directly up and down, right? Whereas with a tail dragger, it will be sitting like this. It will meet the air in a different angle. That means that the uh, prope uh, propeller blade on the right side will create more uh, thrust. So what does this mean in total? Well, it means that the plane will want to go this way. That's what it means. Keep that in mind, by the way, because uh, left turning tendency is uh, the bread and butter of tail dragger flying. All right, so more left turning tendencies. We have something called a slipstream effect. Okay, so the propeller is rotating this way. So the air will kind of spiral its way back like this. That means that the, a lot of the air will be hitting on the left side of the fuselage and in particular on the rudder. What does that mean? Well, of course, it's like a crosswind. It's going to push the tail that way. What is that going to do? Well, here we go again. Back to the left. So the slipstream will do that to you as well. Propeller goes this way. Newton's third law says that there is an equal and opposite reaction, which means that the plane will be turning one turn to the left torque. What does that mean for us? Well, it means the plane will kind of lean a little bit down here, a little bit up here. Not so much visible on the ground, unless you have a really powerful engine and give a lot of power all at once. But the effect will partially be that your left gear will be pushed a little bit into the ground, which could create a little bit more uh, friction, which could hold your left wheel back a little bit, which will turn your to the left a little bit. But more importantly is when you get just started to fly at slow speed before the rudder has a lot of impact and the uh, plane tends to you know do what the torque dictates, that means that this force will be stronger at low speeds, which is a very crucial point. And very importantly, as we talked about previously, about um, adverse yaw with the uh, ailerons. The natural tendency you would have if the right wing came up, and the left one went down, you would want to counteract that with turning to the right. right? That brings this aileron down, 
What does that do? That creates drag, so it will pull that wing to the left. Well, how about that? So you have more drag. And you, you it could even possibly, if you're really unlucky at low speed, stall that wing. And uh, before you know it, you will have a stall spin going. That's not a good thing. We will try to avoid that. So what do you do? Rudder is the answer. All right, let's do a quick discussion about center of gravity, CG. That's rather important for tail draggers. So let's just say that the uh, CG is uh, on top of the main wheels here. What can you expect that to entail? Well, the plane on taxiing will be relatively balanced as far as where it wants to go. The uh, problem, however, is that it's very easy to tip over on the front uh, if you push the brakes too hard. So that is not ideal. And regardless, it's going to be behind somewhere like this, for example. That's probably more likely. The, the thing with this is that just how physics work, this uh, weight here will want to be in front of the pivot point of the, uh, the plane where the wheel is. Which is why ground loops happen with tail draggers and uh, why they are so hilarious. And the thing is that the further back, let's just say you have some very heavy stuff in the uh, back of the plane, that's going to make the tail want to be in front of the pivot point even more. So you want to have the CG as far forward as possible and also preferably as low as possible. You know, ideally it will be somewhere around here, but that's not going to happen. But at least as far forward as possible without it being in front of the wheels, of course, and also, uh, you know, taking into consideration the fact that if you push the brakes too hard, you will tip over. Now, there are some rather curious effects about this that we need to discuss. So, the wheel stance of the plane, whether it is a wide stance or a narrow, which some planes are, or even wider, let's say the, uh, the main wheels are out here. That is of importance, and here's why. Let's just put uh, um, wheel stance number one out here somewhere. And uh, this is number two, the uh, this uh, beaver. And let's say we have a third one, which is even narrower. Okay. So the thing here is that if you're when you're, for example, taxing this tailwheel, if you keep it straight and everything else is equal, it will go in between. But that's perfectly fine. That's where you want it to be. Okay. However, if, for example, you um, come in a position where the tail wheel, let's say, for example, uh, in uh, let's in the beaver case, then, the the wheel goes towards the wheel or outside of it, that's the, the direction it wants to go. That means you're on your way into a ground loop, and more often than not, it is uh, not. Uh, recoverable. It is inevitable for many reasons. Uh, for one thing, let's say let's just say that the the track of the um, uh, the uh, tail wheel is on its way just outside of the right wheel here. If you push this brake on the right side, because that's your tendency to want to do, what you will do then? is force that tail even further to the right. So the right brake is the wrong brake, basically. The left one will, of course, be also the wrong brake. So any brake will be the wrong one. Rudder might help you, but if the tail wheel has been unlocked, well, then that's not going to help either. You may be able to uh, to deal with it with uh, adverse yaw, 
but depending on how much speed you have, that might not even be enough. At which point, you're on your way out into the grass, if you're lucky. Uh, unless, of course, you have quite a bit of speed in the plane. If you're really fast, uh, like, you know, almost takeoff speed, then you might be able to uh, give it a bun bunch of power and uh, take off again. Now, if the, um, in the beaver case, beaver's case, the, uh, the tail is still inside of that wheel, the brakes on the right side will be beneficial. You can use them and you will be more inclined to, to be able to get out of the, uh, um, the ground loop. So here's the point I was about to make about the wheel stance. So if you have like a, you know, the, the three a really narrow spacing between the um, main wheels. Uh, and I know that uh, the um, T6 Texan was designed with a very narrow main wheel setup for the reason uh, that pilots needed to be trained uh, in a plane that is unstable on the ground. So that it, it doesn't take much for the, uh, for the tail to be on its way outside. So you really have to be dancing on the rudders and, uh, you know, be proactive. Whereas, for example, um, um, like, for example, Spitfire, just for a comparison, it may not be as wide as one, but let's just say it is. You have to be really on your way out for the tail to want to be on that direction. You're basically going sideways already. So the wider the wheel stands, the uh, less prone you are to have um, a ground loop, or at least you you have more options for uh, recovery. Now, gyroscopic effect. So when the uh, plane is sitting with the tail low like this, you have a big uh, rotating mass in the front of the plane. On its own, it has all of these weird tendencies to go uh, to, the, to the left. But in addition to that, when you have a big spinning mass like this, when you move, when you change the angle of it, you will have a gyroscopic precession. Uh, and the bigger the, the disk of that moving mass is, and the heavier it is, the greater the effect. So when you uh, take off, given that you uh, raise the tail on takeoff, that this angle will move slightly in this direction up here to be vertical. Not much. It's not much. You know what? What, what is? What is this? Like ten degrees? Something like that? Maybe? Mm, yeah. But that is a huge propeller with a lot of mass and a lot of inertia to it. And that's going to make the um, plane want to go to the left. And explaining gyroscopic precession is not going to be something I can do. Uh, if you want to look it up uh, to get it explained, I suggest you do that. But you can do a simple experiment with a gyroscope. Get one of these and try it out for yourself. Try spinning this up to a great speed and then try to move it and you can feel it. I can feel it just spinning it up with my fingers. I can feel it the way it wants to turn um, effects uh, whether it you know, uh, leans or not. So this is uh, you can simulate a propeller uh, with this one. Um, I can feel it with this one. This is 200 grams. I don't know how heavy the propeller of the beaver is, but it's uh, it's massive. This is to say that in at the point where you take off and you lift the tail, that's when you're going to get the, the left turning tendency of the propeller. 
So in a level flight, you will not feel it because the propeller is going to be uh, vertical for the most part. But let's say you slow down uh, for slow flight, for example, and then your propeller is going to be angled this way again. And then you add power to get out of that slow flight. Then you will have that left turning again. Interestingly, and uh, we'll get back to this, uh, when you're flying a tail dragger, you have a few options for landing. And one of them is to land on the main wheels and uh, with the tail up, and then gradually as speed comes down, lower the tail. That's going to change your the angle of your propeller from being vertical back to being uh, at the angle that it's sitting at right now. That's going to have the reverse effect. So for once, and perhaps it's the only once, I'm not sure, uh, at least one of the few instances, you will get a right turning tendency as you're landing. So when you're doing a wheel landing, that's uh, a little bit of a tendency that you can have. Uh, but then again, you tend to be a low power setting at, uh, at uh, that time, so you don't have a lot of energy in, in the propeller. If you were able to somehow have the propeller spinning at a huge rate uh, on landing uh, while you're setting your tail down, then you might get a, more of a gyroscopic precession based on that. But um, it's going to be on takeoff. And of course, it's going to be to the left, as everything else conspires to do. All of this might be the reason why landing in a three-point, where you're landing like you're sitting uh, on the ground. Um, or even better, slightly better, with the tail ever so slightly before the front, uh, the main wheels. We'll get back to these techniques, but um, avoiding the gyroscopic procession is a good reason for a three-point landing. One more thing about the uh, gyroscopic procession. It's proportional to the abruptness of the movement. So, say you're taking off and you yank the tail up with the uh, yoke of the stick. Well, that movement is going to be very big. It's going to be really big. And it might be happening at a time where you don't have enough um, airspeed to use the rudder to counteract it. So if you find yourself taking off in the sim like this and uh, you're going to the left because you're forcing the tail up, that might just be why. It's the gyroscopic effect kicking off. But of course, it's going to be all the other things as well. So the thing is that when you're taking off, if you raise the tail at all, you don't have to. You can take off in a three-point attitude, like it's sitting on the ground, like now. But if you want to have the tail up, you can do it slowly uh, over the course of the takeoff run, and you can apportion it, um, th that effect, out, and you will have more control over it. So that the sum total of the effect will still be there, so if you portion it out, you will have more time to use all that uh, that uh, gyroscopic precession. So as I said, all of these forces will conspire to draw you to the left, uh, and uh, you'll have to use all your technique to hold the plane steady. So a little detail also that is very important about the difference between a um, uh, tail dragger and a tricycle gear airplane. If you look at how much of the plane is behind the pivot point, you see in, in, the, in the beaver it's uh, like 80% uh, of the plane is behind it. And a lot, of it, a lot of the plane behind it is relatively... there's a large surface here. The the front, the engine, the cowling, it's not that big if you compare it to this. Maybe even 90% of the uh, surface area on the, uh, on the side of the plane is behind the pivot point. Whereas, if you uh, grab a quick look at this uh, Cessna over here, 
the pivot point being uh, the main wheel here, you see that it's, uh, well, there's a, they're more than 50% behind it. It's not that much, maybe 60, 40. That is gonna be important. Why? Weather waning. So it's simple, it's, uh, if you have a crosswind with a tail dragger, more of it will hit this uh, or the other side of the plane. So with all that surface area behind the pivot point, what will that do to an airplane? This is going to be very important because when you feel the crosswind on the plane, you have to kind of imagine what the plane wants to do because of this. So you have the wind coming from the left here. Where does the plane want to go? Well, you think that it will go to the right? No, that would be wrong. It will go to the left. Because all of this surface area behind here is going to be pushed this way. And it will pivot over the main wheels. And it will go to the left. Of course, it's going to be the other way. If it's the other way. Wind comes from this way. Tail wind will want to go that way. Pivots around here and goes to the right. Which is to say, in general, if you want to choose um, wind for uh, uh, takeoff, if you want to choose a crosswind, you will want a right crosswind. Because this will be one of the few times where you will have a right turning tendency um, with the tail dragger. Or any plane for that matter. Uh, many of these effects that we'll be talking about uh, are also uh, in uh, normal propeller uh, tricycle airplanes. But especially in a tail dragger, if you uh, have to have a crosswind, take it from the right. To three or not to three? That is the question. What am I talking about here? Of course, well, do you take off in a three-point attitude like this, or do you lift the tail and take off on the main wheels? So that's one question. Do you land on the main wheels and then lower the tail, or do you land in a three-point attitude like it's sitting right now? That's what we're going to discuss now. Takeoffs. So you have two choices in general. You can do a three point takeoff, like where the plane is sitting now um, in a three point attitude, or during the takeoff run, you can lift the tail and, uh, you know, take off from the main wheels. So that's basically uh, the two choices you have. Um, and they both have their. Um, benefits and uh, disadvantages. So for the three point takeoff, so in this position where it's now, so you will be at more or less the best angle of climb as you lift off. So you will have a short ground run and you will be ready to clear obstacles relatively fast. Um, so that's a benefit in that instance. However, if you are taking off on a very rough surface, like gravel or something like that, the tail, the the slightly um, flimsy tail wheel, will be dragged through all of that mess. So that's kind of a disadvantage. Also, because you're lifting off at a slower speed, you are much more vulnerable for gusts um, and uh, downdrafts and all of that. Uh, so uh, that's something to keep in mind. Of course, as you know, when the, the plane is in the three-point attitude, you will see nothing in front of you. So you will have poor visibility, which is uh, something that you might want to consider thinking about. At least have a plan for what, you, uh, what you're taking off above. Also, some planes will have a poor cooling of the engine while in this attitude. So the wind is not coming straight into the cowling. Uh, but it's kind of coming in into an, in an angle, uh, which might not spread the uh, the air correctly inside of the uh, cowling. So, 
it has its benefits and its uh, disadvantages. However, the uh, main wheel takeoff when you lift the um, tail, so that's going to be uh, you will have more control if the, there's uh, gusty winds. So that's a good thing. Because you're also raising the tail away from the ground and relying on the main wheels, which are much bigger and more sturdy, you will be better. Uh, that will be better suited for very rough surfaces. Um, and of course, again, the visibility will be better because you're lowering the nose, and uh, the cooling will be better. The problem here, though, is that this will add quite significantly to your uh, takeoff run and also the fact that you're taking the uh, the tailwheel out of the equation as far as controlling the plane the direction of the plane that may or may not uh, allow you less control of the steering of the plane also the tail will come up into the airflow so that's a good thing but that might that transition between the tail being on the ground and the coming up into the air or more into the air is kind of a in my experience at least, uh, a bit of a vulnerable place to be in. Another factor, of course, is the transition from uh, tail low to tail high is going to add that uh, gyroscopic precession into the mix that we talked about. So all the left turning tendencies will now be in effect. So as you get that extra left turning tendency, you will lose contact with the tail wheel and might not have all that airflow over the tail. So um, be careful, is all I'm saying. So we've discussed the uh, benefits and uh, disadvantages of taking off in a three point uh, attitude and uh, on the main wheels. So now let's discuss the landing. How do you choose between one or the other? Well, one factor may be what the plane is designed for. Maybe it can do the one and not the other. Let's just leave that out. Uh, this plane can do both. How do you choose between landing on the main wheels or the three-point? Let's talk about three-point landings first. So one of the benefits is that you will be slower. To be able to, f to land in a three-point, you have to be slower. So that's going to make your um, uh, ground run shorter. Also, you will land with your tailwheel basically on the ground already, so you will have that benefit of the steering. And because you're not changing angle of the plane with the tail lowering of the tail, you will not have that gyroscopic procession. So you won't have that uh, messing around with you. Uh, also, uh, because the plane is almost stalling, the plane is ready to stop flying. So you won't be back in the air and uh, bouncing along. So that's a bunch of good reasons for landing in a three-point. However, disadvantages two three-point landings. In crosswinds, it might be difficult to control the plane, basically because you're having less airflow uh, to work with. So being that slow might be a problem with, with a crosswind. Also, if you're going to be landing in a three-point, you cannot come down very fast over an obstacle, because then you will add speed and uh, the three-point will be uh, impossible or you will have to float. So that's going to add to your landing distance in that case, if you try to three-point uh, coming over an obstacle. And uh, another factor is that because you are in this position like this, you see the big cowling of the engine, uh, depending of course on the airplane type, it's going to be in your way. Uh, so if you're coming and dragging it in with power in a three-point attitude, you might not see very much what you're doing. So you have to use the uh, Lindbergh reference. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, or just know where you're going and hope for the best. Well, 
when uh, doing a three-point landing, what you can actually do with great benefit is actually to do a one-point landing. Land with the tail wheel slightly before you touch down on the mains. Why? Well, so here's the deal. If you land directly on the three-point attitude, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the plane is going to be very slow and uh, the wing is ready to stop flying. If it are able to finagle the plane into such a position where the tail strikes just before uh, the main, main wheels touch down, what is going to happen is that the angle of the wings, if they are like this, if the tail hits first, then when the plane is on its way down, the angle of the wing is going to go down this way. Right, it's going to move that direction. What will that do? Well, it will decrease the angle of attack. And what will that do? Well, it will spoil the lift. So even if the plane had enough speed to fly at this point, when it goes down to this point, the wing will stop flying and the plane will stay on the ground. Wheel landings. Some advantages is that you can uh, get a good obstacle clearance. Why? Well, because you can have a high descent rate. You can dive down uh, over trees or fences or whatever it is and stick it on the main wheels. Um, and your speed can be higher. And why is that a benefit? Well, as opposed to a uh, three point uh, attitude for landing, your speed can be almost whatever it is. And when you, your speed is higher, you will have much more airflow over the uh, wings and the tail, which will grant you control uh, during crosswinds. Also, because your attitude will be with a nose low, you will be able to see in front of the plane. So when you're diving into the bush with a, a tail dragger, you can clear obstacles and you can see where you're going. If the, line, uh, the landing strip is long enough, of course, you can transition from the dive and uh, see where you're going into a three-point attitude. I do that a lot. I do kind of a combination. I'm kind of initially aiming for a wheel landing. And then if I see that I have room enough, I will let the speed bleed off and then let the plane sink down in a three-point attitude. But if you, have, if you have a crosswind, you might have to just stick it down on the main wheels. A little uh, detail to remember when doing a wheel landing is that when you're doing the wheel landing the wing will be level with the horizon more or less and once you lower the tail the wing will increase the angle of attack which if you have speed enough will make the plane fly again okay so when you approach to land on the main wheels thing is to try to, to get the speed down low enough before you let the tail come down. One of the mistakes I did early on when uh, doing uh, uh, main wheel landings is that I let, so I kept the controls neutral or something like this, and uh, once I touch down, the inertia of the plane will make basically bounce the plane downward somewhat. What will happen then is that the the wings, which which are level, will then increase their angle of attack and the plane will start flying again. This is not a bounce as much as it is just taken off again. It feels like a bounce, but it isn't really that. Uh, it will help, of course, if you have springy uh, undercarriage or you know soft tundra tires. That will kind of add to it by bouncing, but the tail coming down will increase the angle of attack and you will start flying again. So the technique when landing, and I'm going to show you this later, is that when you land on the main wheels, keep the wing level with the, um, with the horizon by pushing slightly forward. And you can be actually a bit rough on this because the, uh, the plane will still be, uh, the, um, the tail will still be flying. And uh, it won't just allow the plane to tip over on the nose. 
but it will keep the uh, main wheels planted on the ground uh, and the plane will stay uh, stay down and when you slow down then you can gradually uh, release the back, uh, forward pressure and even start bringing it down if you know that you're slow enough for the plane not to take off again so once you get the tail down you can start steering with the tail wheel and all of that so, so those are the benefits of uh, the main wheel landing but how about the uh, problems with main wheel landings well so you have more speed so very likely you will have a longer landing distance uh, also as i said when the tail uh if the tail comes down during the landing the plane might start flying again also you will have to transition through that very scary place where once you are starting to lower the tail the uh, rudder will kind of fade out the effect of the rudder will fade out and it will do that just before your tail wheel hits the ground so you will be in a kind of a limbo right there uh, where you don't have the tail on the ground and the rudder doesn't do very much and as i'll explain later if you do a lot of things with the rudder you might throw the tail wheel out of lock which will give you a nasty surprise when you uh, finally get it back on the ground uh, and also the last thing which is discussed earlier but it's uh something to keep in mind when you change the angle of the plane the gyroscope that the propeller is will give you the gyroscopic precession to the right so just be prepared for uh, a right turning tendency because of this during that scary part one thing you can do to remedy some of these problems uh, with the main wheel landing is that you can use uh, a little power a boost of throttle basically uh, that can actually work almost like a power steering because when you give, the, give uh, a boost of power the prop wash will go over the rudder which will give you some airflow needed to steer uh, and of course if everything else fails you can just keep on adding power and take off again but if you uh if you need a little oomph to get the plane stared back or around something or whatever uh, that can be done while still committing to the landing uh, there are quite a few landings that i've done with the beaver where uh, a little boost of power just as i'm starting to feel that i'm losing control have it i think it has saved me at least and uh, many times to where I have lost control, where I think that if I either did the go around or gave it a little shot of power would have saved me. Well, you never know, but I, I think that's a very good and viable um, tool to have available. A note on flaps, on landing. Uh, you've probably all seen uh, bush pilots pull their flaps up uh, when they once they land there's a reason for this when you take out that curvature of the uh, wing that you gain from having the flaps down you take off take out some of the lift uh, in some cases quite a bit of it that will help the plane not fly again so if you're in really bumpy terrain you might very well benefit from taking the flaps up because that won't allow you to bounce up in the air again you will bounce but you will fall really firmly back to ground uh, whereas if you keep the flaps that might just very well start your flying again and uh, that's going to be more difficult to recover from because while uh, while you can start you know adding power and you know go around you might be too slow for that to be uh, effective and also if you add a lot of power once that slow uh, the torque and all of the other left turning tendencies will uh, start messing around with you so pulling the flaps up is a good idea however 
only if you can do it fast enough and without disrupting everything else you're doing. So for example, if you have uh, like uh, some of these uh, uh, carbon cups or whatever it is, where you have a lever that you can just crank up uh, or down or whatever it is, and the flaps will be instantly up. That's going to be very quickly changing the uh, characteristic of the wing and you will stop flying. If you have slow electric flaps, well, you can do it and uh, they will, you know, do it by themselves. They will retract. So you can just pull up the lever and, uh, you know, continue with your landing roll. With a plane like the Beaver, uh, that's not going to be very easy because it has uh, hydraulically pumped flaps. You see me pumping down the flaps here. So that's flaps down. That's probably a bit more than I usually have because it, this, that's kind of an emergency flap setting. So it, it's going to be like this. So if once I land, I have to struggle and pump the flaps back up again. And by now, I've already ground looped because I've been busy doing that. So you have to know what you are capable of doing uh, during landing. I don't think I've ever retracted the flaps on landing because I just have my hands full of everything else. But if you if you have a plane where you can just yank them up, uh, that's going to be a good idea. So crosswinds uh, for takeoff and landing. Uh, there is actually something to consider here. So if everything else is equal and you have a direct crosswind and uh, obstacles um, are kind of equal on both sides of the runway and uh, the runway is flat, you know, everything is equal. The only consideration is whether you take the crosswind from the uh, right or from the left. So we talked about the left turning tendencies of a tail dragger or any plane for that matter. So the plane wants to go to the left. So if you have a wind coming from the left, pushing on this huge uh, weather waning side of the plane, that will push the wind to the right and add to your left turning tendency. So all things being equal, take off with a right crosswind. Take it from the right, that will push your tail to the left, which will push your nose to the right. So we'll kind of take out some of that um, tendency to go to the left. Landing, in general, not that important. It's not going to be that big of a factor. But if you, for example, uh, plan on landing on the main wheels, remember that when you lower the uh, tail, the gyroscopic position will, for once, pull you to the right. So if everything else is equal, uh, you will want to have a left crosswind when landing on the main wheels because of that uh, gyroscopic position. However, there is one more big and one more much larger factor here. If you suspect a, that a go-around is just ever so slightly possible, then you probably should choose the uh, right crosswind as with the takeoff because when you transition from the landing uh, into a go-around, then all your left turning tendencies will come back. So, uh, and that's a that's a bit of a scary place to be at if you already have uh, the wind coming from the left. So, um, in, to summarize, uh, take off, um, right crosswind, landing, probably also right crosswind because of the go around. But if you don't suspect a go around and you plan on landing on the main wheels take the left crosswind to combat the uh, gyroscopic precession. Now let's talk about the uh, the tail wheel here. It's uh, rather important for uh, any uh, tail dragger pile to know what kind of mechanism is situated here and what it does and uh, what its limitations are. And I can only sh show you a little bit of it now while sitting on the ground here. But we can go through a few very basic details. So one thing that you probably are familiar with in uh, tricycle planes is that once when you push on the uh, rudder, 
um, the rudder, of course, moves, and the nose wheel moves with it to uh, more or less degree. But you see, it does the same here. It follows. Not all uh, tail draggers will do that. Some tail draggers have a completely free castering, swiveling um, tail wheel, and it goes basically wherever you point the, uh, the plane, which is basically like a shopping cart wheel. Um, so if, if your plane is going forward, the, the wheel will be aligned like this. And if you push the brake and uh, the right brake, for example, uh, you know, pushing the tail uh, to the left, the wheel will go like this. You know, it will follow the uh, direction of the plane. But you cannot steer with it. You, you, you cannot do manipulate the direction of the uh, plane with the wheel. The wheel will just be there to facilitate whatever movement you already have in the plane. Some planes are, as I said, free castering. Some are free castering, but with a locking mechanism. So, for example, the uh, I think it is the DC-3 is a very common example where you want to, for example, when you are about to take off, you line up on the runway and check that the wheel is actually lined up. And then you there's a physical lock where you lock it in a straight line. Um, which means that uh, all the steering you have now uh, is going to be with a differential braking or maybe differential thrust, I don't know, with the two engines. Uh, or And of course rudder and uh, aileron. Which means, of course, that if you start you know, having sideways motion with the tail, that wheel will start sliding literally on the pavement or on the grass or whatever your surface is. Whereas with a free castering, it will turn to facilitate it. Now, you might ask what the deal is with the beaver. Well, the beaver has both. And uh, many uh, tailwheel aircraft have both. In the case of the beaver, you can turn. Uh, I'm deliberately not turning full deflection because that mechanism will keep um, uh, synchronized with the rudder to a certain extent. Uh, I think it's 25 degrees. At which point, and uh, I'll do that now, at which point it will now, it will unlock. Do you see that? Now it's completely unlocked. It doesn't follow. But it will regain, it will kind of capture that mechanism. It will capture once it's in uh, the same position again, or within the f 25 degrees. Now this is pretty easy to control as I'm sitting still right now, because the wheel isn't going anywhere on its own. But once we start taxiing, and I will demonstrate that very soon, you will see that this is very important to practice. Uh, in some planes, the rudder deflection doesn't have any bearing on that. However, the elevator will have a bearing on that. So, for example, the um, the T6 that I mentioned um, when discussing discussing the wheel stance, uh, and I think also the um, uh, North American P51 has a mechanism that relies on the um, placement of the elevator. So right now it's more or less neutral. And in these planes, if you are neutral or forward with the stick, it is free castering. Then it, it will go wherever it wants to, like a shopping cart. Uh, but if you hold the stick uh, back from neutral uh, on the ground when taxing, it will follow the rudder. Uh, and I think it will follow through the full range of motion. So it will not unlock like you see it do it's, it's doing right now. So that is a very clever mechanism, because that means that you have a direct correlation uh, with uh, the elevator. However, that can be problematic on landing, where you want to be able to control the elevator separately, uh, and don't have to worry about uh, whether or not your um, uh, wheel is locked or not. That's that's how it works in uh, the Beaver, and uh, you have to know how it works in the plane you're flying. So with that, 
let's go taxiing around on the ramp here a little bit just to see how it works because it's going to be very different once the planes start rolling. Oof, that oil is bad. prop all right fired up and ready to taxi so before I taxi I'm just gonna deal with a little bit of uh, very, very general um, concepts of where you put the controls for wind correction. So there's no wind today, so we don't have to deal with that. But in general, uh, this uh, uh, general rule is that you have the ailerons into the wind. So if the wind is coming from the left, you turn into the wind. Wind from the right, you turn, in, turn to the right. It's going to just assist you a little bit in keeping the plane, uh, you know, centered. And we discussed it previously, because of the large area of the plane behind the pivot point of the plane will tend to make the plane weather vane a lot, more, much more than uh, a normal tricycle plane. So uh, so any, any help you can get. Also, as far as elevator goes, in a low power setting on taxing, for example, um, if you have a headwind, you climb into the headwind, so you pull the stick back. This will make the uh, wind that is coming over the, ta uh, the um, tail and the uh, elevator will push it down firmly into the ground, which will give you more friction on the uh, tail wheel, which will be helpful for steering. It also will assist you in keeping away from tipping over on your nose, which is a good thing. Contrary, if you have a tailwind, you dive away from the uh, tailwind. So, and you can see what this does. If the wind is coming from the rear here. It will hit the uh, elevator and push the tail down, which will basically do the same thing. However, you have to be conscious about how much power you give to the plane, because if you... Uh, are on, a, for example, uphill, or uh, if you're uh, about to take off, or uh, you know, doing a run-up, or whatever you're doing. If you have a moderately high power setting, the prop wash will kind of tend to uh, to favor uh, uh, elevator back or up rather. In general, I, I tend to keep it, uh, you know, favor it, you know, holding it back. But if it's a very strong tail a tailwind, uh, you have to be mindful that, uh, you know, keeping it that way will actually potentially lift your tail. Now, let's start taxing. So we have a little bit of room here on the ramp. And uh, we'll uh, just uh, roll around a little bit, and uh, I'll show you first from inside the plane what it looks like. And uh, I'll show you a camera angle, uh, like uh, something like this, uh, where you will see how the tail works during taxi. So, uh, nobody's around, and I don't expect anyone to be around either. So, let's just uh, start rolling around. Brakes are off. Let's just see what it does. At least loosen the brakes. Okay, so it's gonna start going forward. So I'm gonna turn around here, come back. Now you see, I now I'm not doing anything. I just uh, have the uh, 
rather neutral. The plane is going uh, in around. Hmm. And if you're not aware how to stop this, this can be infuriating. But uh, this is uh, very much uh, par for the course. So, a little bit of break. And a little bit of wiggling with the rudder. We'll get it back in control. Now the uh, tail is locked again. So I'll taxi over here and uh, spin around again. Being, of course, mindful that uh, they, there's a lot of plane behind me here, so if, I, if I'm too wide with the turn, I'll smack things. So let's just see here. I can take taxi forward now. The tail wheel is now locked. If I turn to the left, it will go to the left. If I turn to the right, it will go to the right. So it will do what I want it to do. But if I turn too much to the right, like now, let's do a left turn with the rudder. Nothing is happening. The plane is still going to the right. I have to go continue here, smacking these uh, poor assassins out of the ramp here. So that's the trick here. Sometimes you can unlock it, the tail wheel, and then the plane will go wherever it was on its way to go. And uh, let's let's uh, try something here. Let's do a camera angle from outside so you can have an idea what it, this looks like. Okay, so now we're looking from, uh, from outside. Now I have full right rudder, and I'm going to take a little bit of break, and I'm going to turn the rudder to the left. Probably not see it, but now I have full left rudder. So you would expect the plane to start turning to the left, but it doesn't. Oh, I'm using the brakes now to uh, to move it around. So you, the rudder that I'm moving around now doesn't do anything because the tail wheel is free castering now. It, it has been unlocked. So, to stop that turn, I can use the left brake, the, uh, the outside brake, basically, and now it wants to go to the left. So now I have to wiggle, you can probably see that. Now it's locked again. So, doing a little bit of ramp romping around with a tail dragger uh, is very useful. And also to just allow yourself some time to taxi back and forth on a taxiway to get a feel for what the plane wants to do so that you're not surprised uh, when it's when, uh, when it's really important to know how to, to make the plane go where you want. As you can see it's very nimble. You can make the even a big plane like the Beaver do quite a lot of interesting things uh, and you can park it in a much tighter spot than you can with a uh, normal tricycle plane. Now uh, I'm gonna make the plane go straight ahead and uh, I'll change the camera angle so you can have an idea of what's going on here. Alright, let's have a look at this. So, as I uh, showed you when uh, doing the uh, uh, ground school portion of this uh, little video, the uh, tail wheel is locked to the rudder now. But let's start rolling. So, if I do a left turn now and come to a certain point, now it's unlocked. Do a little bit of brake to make the plane more uh, go more steeply. Now it seems like I'm doing what what I want, um, like the plane is doing what I want it to do. But if I do a right rudder, it still goes to the left. That's because it's unlocked. This doesn't have any bearing on where the plane goes, apart from maybe a little bit of the wind, but it's going too slowly for it to be a factor. So now I have to use the right brake to make that turn stop. But you see that the wheel is still going that way. So if I just release the brakes now, well, now actually the, the wind picked me up and pulled me, but I'm still unlocked. So the wind is the, the thing that is doing this, but uh, it's not really uh, helping me. So when the uh, wheel is unlocked, you have to um, kind of figure out a way how to wiggle it back into lock position. And I'm going to try to do that now. So I'm lined up with the taxiway. So I'm going to use a little bit of brakes to 
Okay, now it actually uh, went into position. It doesn't always do that as quickly as that. Let's unlock it. There, you have to wiggle it back into position. And the thing is that once it's unlocked... Uh, let's see here. Now I'm using the brakes to, uh, to manipulate it here. Uh, I'm going to make it go a little bit to the left here. I'm able to do that. Seems like it wants to go to the right. That's probably because of the uh, pop wash here. So anyway, the, the thing is that if you're outside of the uh, uh, 20, 25 degree uh, angle, uh, at which uh, point where the uh, tail will be locked to the rudder, you cannot recapture it. So if you're in this position here, the tail will, uh, the tail wheel will not come back into position. It will not care where your rudder is. You have to be in that area. And yeah, now you saw it catch. So you have to kind of taxi around and just get a feel for where, what it's doing. Now you see it's unlocked. Left turn with the rudder won't do much. Actually, that was the prop wash doing that for me. Or maybe the wind, if the wind has picked up. So, so if you can see me steering here now, th th that's small shots of brake that I'm using. Uh, so it's it's, um, it's very useful to be uh, to be able to uh, to give small bursts of, um, of uh, brake to uh, to stop these turns. But it can be a bit frustrating because what happens when you, for example, uh, have uh, you know turned your plane in the direction you want to go. Um, and the tail is unlocked. So the plane will start just going in that same direction that it was when it when you stopped. See if I just do a stop right now, that, that, that's the where the uh, uh, the tail wheel is going that way. Whereas the rudder is straight. So I would expect the plane to go straight now, but it will start turning to the right. Actually now it's captured. So that's actually good. Sometimes it will kind of wander through this capturing part because this mechanism is not perfect um, and um, I'm gonna post some links in the description of the video um, where you can actually see in the real life someone actually filming like this um, uh, the tail wheel as uh, they're you know toying around on the ramp and it's doing the same thing it's uh, sometimes it's capturing and sometimes he has to wiggle a little bit to get it now, there it is. So, worth spending a lot of time practicing with. So, there are some other factors with taxing a tail dragger. For example, the fact that you cannot see anything. Let's get into that. All right, I'm lining myself up on the taxiway here at the Willow Barber. And uh, I'm going to taxi down the taxiway. Uh, as you can see, you can't see. So, what are you going to do about this? Well, of course, you can set up uh, camera angles that kind of cheat. Uh, but that's not fun. And uh, also, you cannot do that in real life. So here's the deal. You can do in real life like this, lean a little bit, but you still cannot see, depending on how big the uh, cowling of the plane is. Uh, in a Piper Cub, you will still have that big in the center, but it will be slightly narrower. With a big radial engine like this, you cannot see anything. So S-turns are the key here. So what I do is I taxi over to the edge of the uh, taxiway, and then I turn to the right. Now you can see the taxiway. So I do a slight, you know, merging over to the right side when I'm turning to the right, because I can see through that little gap here. But once I get to the, uh, to the other side of the taxiway, I have to turn back. And if I am gonna get something out of it, I have to turn quite steeply to be able to see anything. And I cannot do it for long, because now I'm doing a steep turn. 
and then I have to turn back again. And I can do a very shallow turn to the right. So I have to just have to uh, just almost pretend that there's nothing behind here. So I see that there's nothing here now, and I do my left turn, checking, okay, I see nothing here now, so I just have to trust that that's going to remain the same during my right turn here. What you can do is, once you've done a few clearing turns, you can probably see that, okay, it's probably going to be uh, fine. So you can s stay straight for a little while, but then you have to do a clearing turn to check. And that's just how the nature of the beast is. You cannot avoid it. Uh, you can, of course, just taxi blindly, but it's that's irresponsible, and uh, you will potentially taxi into another plane. We've seen videos of this in real life, where tail draggers are taxiing and then either going straight into the tail of another plane, or having suddenly seeing the tail, and then have to suddenly stop. And uh, what happens if you push the brakes too hard, depending on the, how grippy the surface is, well, you can nose over, and uh, that's going to ruin, you know, ruin your day. This is actually the wrong runway for me. I'm going to taxi back, and I'm going to show you something else on my way back. So let me just do this, and I'll show you how nimble the plane is. You cannot do this with a, with a uh, tricycle plane. So I'm going to do full left, and a le left brake. I just managed to avoid the taxi lights, that's um, the taxiway lights. And I'm going to try to wiggle it back into going straight. There it is. Now it's captured. And that thing that I just did, where I almost clipped the uh, uh, taxiway light here, that's going to be the topic of the discussion now. When you have a tail dragger, you have a lot of plane behind the pivot point. So if I just do a little bit of turning, you see the tail is going out to the side. You can probably see it much better from here. A little bit of turn, and, and the, the plane is not moving a lot to the to around the center line here. But the tail is moving a lot. So the thing is that when you do your S turns, you have to be in, uh, keep in mind that now the, that right wheel is on the edge of the uh, taxiway. But if you do a very steep turn to the left, uh, as you have to do with the uh, with the left turn, if you do too steep a turn, the tail will go out into the uh, to the ditch. As you can probably, I'm going to try to do that now. Actually, I tried. I actually managed to avoid it. Let's do a little bit steep, steeper turn. Actually, I'm able to avoid it. And if I do, if I turn much, much more steeply. Uh, I will unlock the uh, tail wheel. So you see that it's actually uh, this plane uh, is actually able to uh, to avoid that. And depending on the stance and the width of the uh, main wheel and uh, the length of the plane, and how steep you are able to make the turn without, for example, let's if I do it too steeply like this, now it's unlocked. So now it went into the uh, to the grass. So I will I will never do that. But if I keep it within uh, uh, where I have the control of the tailwheel, um, it seems like this plane will behave so that it will keep itself inside of the taxiway. That of course depends on how wide the taxiway is, because on actually a wider taxiway you're able to approach the uh, edge of the taxiway with a steeper angle, which might make you... Uh, like uh, get, get out in the grass but that's at least a consideration uh, so narrower taxiways will actually be beneficial in some instances but of course they will also have uh, you'll have less room to look out in front uh, during these S turns so another thing is that uh, while you're taxiing um, 
And uh, this is probably more suitable when you're taxiing on a wider taxiway where you can actually see the side of it. Uh, but regardless of that, the, and of course this depends on how your field of view is on uh, the monitor you're on. I'm uh, on a particularly wide monitor, so I can see the side of the uh, the side window here in my peripheral vision, which is very helpful. So now you can see. Uh, you can see the grass and uh, the taxiway on that side, and you can barely see the uh, yellow line here. So that gives me a peripheral uh, kind of a landmark, something to uh, set my eyes to. But if, even if you have a narrower, narrower field of view, you can gauge how much of uh, this uh, part, maybe you can see something through this window or something about the cowl cowling here. It's worth to, worth calibrating your eyesight to this position because this is the takeoff position. This is where you will start the takeoff roll in. Uh, hopefully, with a little bit more runway visible on the side, which we will see very soon. But it will also be what you will see when you're landing. So, memorizing that point of view is um, it's basically what. Um, I think it's uh, Jason Miller's the, uh, the the finer point of flying. He's talking about the Lindbergh reference. Um, he's using it for uh, normal tricycle planes uh, when flying, and and um, uh, just to get to be able to gauge, you know, uh, what the plane is doing in the air. But it goes for the tailwheels uh, when landing uh, because you cannot see the uh, runway. So while when you're taxiing, spend a little time just getting a feel for how the plane is sitting on the. In its three-point attitude, spending a bit of time taxing the tail dragger is actually very, very useful. Um, with that said, I think we're ready to uh, stop taxing and start flying. A little detail here that I forgot to mention: um, I managed to get myself into a little bit of a pickle here. Uh, I stopped like this. So I need a lot of power to be able to get out of this little rot here. I'm also needing to turn to get away from the grass. And to be able to do that, I need the tail to go to the left, which needs it to go more into the rut. But it will also swing near this light here. So that's one thing you have to be aware of when taxiing the tail dragger, is that what where you stop will kind of uh, dictate what's going to happen next. So for me to be able to get out of this, I need to go forward a little bit. And uh, probably need a little bit of power to get out of the grass. And only when I've cleared the, the uh, light, I can start turning to uh, get out of it. And uh, here we have that problem that I talked about where the tail is swinging out. So it turned out okay, but it's uh, sometimes you don't have the, the room to maneuver like that. Also, where and how you stop the plane, in terms of how the tail wheel um, is sitting, is going to be very important, and uh, I will show you once we get on the runway. Well, Barbara Traffic, Beaver 524 Agatha, taking off runway 29er, Well, Harbor. Alright, so I'm going to line up on the runway here. I'm actually not going to take off, but uh, basically going to do that, uh, you know, something similar. So, okay, uh, more or less lined up. Okay, so let's have a look outside the plane. It's not quite lined up, but that's uh, fine enough. Uh, now it's lined up. But here's a problem. The uh, the tail, uh, the tail wheel is not lined up. It's not locked yet. So if I start barreling down the runway now, uh, the, pla the tail wheel is still free castering. And I've done that mistake a few times, uh, where I've neglected to check whether or not it's locked. And that will make your plane do weird things. Let's just try it, just to see what happens. So let's just see what happens when I power up and go down. Now it goes to the left. 
Can I? I'm stopping again. That was, of course, all the left turning tendencies that we talked about previously, but also uh, the tail being unlocked. So I didn't have any control over the um, the direction of the, of the plane with the uh, tail wheel. So what I do when I'm about to take off is that I just to use normal taxi power and I wiggle the rudder back and forth a little bit. Now you can see that the plane is wiggling back and forth. That means that the tail wheel is locked. So now, now I have that uh, piece of control here. So what I'll do now is I'll just do a uh, uh, high-speed taxi down the runway and uh, just uh, see how the plane behaves. And then I'll just turn around and come back and do the same in the other direction. Thirty knots. So I still have the tail down, and I still have control with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, the, with the uh, tail wheel, and I'm holding back pressure to keep the tail down. Okay, so I can set it to idle and hold back pressure while I do very slight braking because if I do too much, it will start nosing over. I find actually doing high-speed taxis slightly more scary than takeoffs because takeoffs will send you up into the air where you will have more control. The high-speed taxi will keep you on the ground where bad things can happen. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing now, but now I'm going to raise the tail and taxi on the main wheels. Welp Harbor traffic, Beaver 5 to Rakafa is doing a high-speed taxi down runway 11, Welp Harbor. Oof, that was bad. Now I'm on the main wheels here. Okay, pulling power. Yeah, really wobbly and ugly. So, uh, do as I say, don't do as I do. Do better than me. Uh, I feel a bit rusty here. Um, that got my pulse up. That little thing there just scary as hell. Much better to just take off. Which we will do right now. But first, let's get the uh, tail wheel locked again. Because now it's sideways. Now you can see the plane is going back and forth. That means it's locked. Alright, let's uh, do a uh, three-point takeoff. So what I'll do now is I'll keep a, a bit of back pressure and I won't be giving it back, basically, or uh, I, at least I won't be um, pushing it forward. I will just maybe release a little bit of the back pressure uh, once the speed is coming up. And the point is to just keep it sitting like it is now until it reaches uh, whatever that is, 50 knots or something like that and uh, the plane will just start flying on its own. Let's see how that goes. Well, Harbor traffic, paper 52 for Akafa, taking off runway 29er, Well, Harbor. Okay, holding back for sure. Take off power is set. The benefit of this, as I said, is I don't have to deal with the gyroscopic effect. There is enough problems with left turning tendencies. So the gyroscopic effect should, if I push the nose over now, it should push me to the left. Actually it's not that pronounced, uh, but of course that's going to also be, uh, be um, uh, 
when I'm flying fast enough, it's not going to be that much. Okay, let's power back here. So, uh, right now, it's uh, really not that different from a normal uh, tricycle plane. Uh, it's, uh, it's only on the ground that the takeoff and uh, the landing phase where it's, uh, and of course taxing, uh, where it's a uh, big deal. Well, power traffic, Beaver 524 Akafa, left base, correct, left crosswind to left downwind runway to Niner, Well Harbor. Beautiful little airport in, uh, in Washington State. Okay, so what I'll do now first, I'll try to do a three-point landing. So I'll just aim to be uh, around 50 knots and uh, just set the plane down in the position it was when I took off. And maybe even a, s a bit slower than 50 knots, because now I'm going to have a lot of flaps. So the plane will be uh, uh, trending towards being uh, slightly more nose high. I'm not uh, type the type of pilot to uh, to be set in uh, into speeds and things like that. I fly a lot based on the feel of the plane, which is uh, not very professional, I guess. But that's just uh, that's just how I do it. So I don't really pay that much attention to the speeds of the plane. Of course, I pay attention, but I, I, I'm not. I don't know what kind of speed I will be at. Well, Harbor traffic, Beaver 524 Gaffa, final, runway 29 or full stop, Well, Harbor. Okay. Short final runway 29. Thank you. So here's one of the things. I If the plane wants to go anywhere, I don't want to panic with the rudders, because if I push too much rudder, I will unlock the tailwheel, and off I go. So I have to keep that in mind. Don't push too much rudder. I can use uh, adverse yaw with the ailerons if I want to. So I will have to turn into the ground loop if I need so. Okay. And slowing down. Uh, that was slightly early. Slightly early. But I still have the tail down. So I'm, I don't have to use any brakes now to uh, to stop the plane. So I'm gonna just turn around and back taxi, and I uh, will do another takeoff. Well, Barber traffic, Beaver five to off and back taxiing, runway two nine or well, Barber. Okay, so uh, you, you probably noticed that I pulled. Uh, the uh, stick back and didn't get uh, all the response that I wanted. And that was basically uh, me running out of uh, uh, elevator authority. I, the plane can go, f go slower, but I pulled out of the too steep a descent. So I had a bit of a mush and I didn't get the benefit of the ground effect because I was, you know, was, was too, too late. Let's get the flaps up a little bit. Wobbling back a little bit to see where I'm going. And uh, let's turn around and get set up for uh, another takeoff. Check that the wheel is locked. Good. Right. This takeoff will be a uh, main wheel takeoff. So once I reach, uh, when, once I 
um, have a reasonable speed, like maybe 30, 40 knots, that area, that area I will uh, release a little bit, bit of the back pressure, maybe push a little bit forward to raise the tail. Of course, being uh, conscious to do it relatively slowly, because the gyroscopic precession will be more uh, pronounced if I do it fast. So I'll do, try to do it slowly, uh, gradually, and um, ride the main wheels and uh, take off in that attitude. Well, power traffic, Beaver 5 to 4 Gamma, taking off runway to Niner. Well, power. Once again, checking that the uh, wheel is locked, and it is. Setting takeoff power. Releasing back pressure. Pushing forward. Now you see a uh, main wheel takeoff. It's better for visibility, that's for sure. And also better for cooling, for this plane at least. Or Echo Alpha turning left across with runway to Niner, well up a harbor. Okay, so now uh, I'll try to do a uh, main wheel landing. Um, I don't quite like the fact that I'm saying that I'm going to try to do it, but uh, that's, uh, that's what you get. I feel that I perform a little bit better when I just fly and normally. When I try to demonstrate, I get more frazzled and more nervous so uh, so uh, this is not a demonstration of how to do it this is just a demonstration of how I do it when I'm under pressure and also uh, the ground school portion the uh, the uh, theoretical background is probably the more important parts of it but uh, it might be interesting for you to see how I do it how I perform so uh, I haven't ground looped yet, but uh, I find that the main wheel landings are slightly more scary and uh, more, uh, more. Uh, uh, feels like I'm more prone to uh, to ground looping when I uh, I'm in the, doing those landings. Well, bomber traffic. Beaver four Alpha left downwind runway two nine. Stop. Well, bomber. So what I'll do is I'll uh, allow for something to happen and I'll do a go-around if I start ground looping. I don't want to ground loop on camera if I can avoid it. But I will show you what I, what I can do to avoid it if I feel that I'm about to do that. So normally I would probably aim for a, a wheel landing, a three-point landing. That's just, it feels better for me to do that. Uh, gets me slower and uh, I have more instant control of the plane. Uh, because the tail is down and I have con contact with the wheel, uh, the tail wheel. Well, power traffic, fever, uh, left, base, runway 29 are full stop. Well, power. However, there are Sometimes you, you just need to be doing wheel landings if the, uh, the surface dictates so or the uh, wind uh, dictates so. So it's good to be able to do both. Well, power traffic, Bieber for Echo Alpha, final runway to Niner, full stop, well up a harbor. Okay, so I'll keep a little bit more speed, set it down on the main wheels, and the thing is, when you're landing, uh, with the tail wheel, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the main wheels, you have to pin it on the uh, main wheels. You have to push the stick forward quite a bit to hold it there, because if you don't, the tail will come down, which will increase your angle of attack, and the plane will start flying again. So it feels like a bounce, but it's not quite that. So if your if your tail comes down too early, the plane basically starts flying again. So pinning it with forward stick. You can do quite a bit. You won't nose over. Unless, of course, you start using the brakes as well. 
pinning it down uh, with the elevator and uh, then slowly releasing it as your speed comes down and then you can pin the tail down once your speed is low enough. Set it on the main wheels, hold it. And the tail is down. And my nerves are frazzled. Okay, that went well. Uh, but uh, it's scary. Um, I probably wouldn't be scared to demonstrate in a Cessna 172 or a, or even the TBM or anything like that that I'm not comfortable with actually flying and operating. Uh, tricycle planes are just so much uh, more predictable when landing. So this looks... it might look easy, but it's not, and uh, uh, I'm always a little bit scared. Which is why I love it. It's fun. Okay, let's... Uh, Get off the runway here and uh, clean the plane up and taxi back to the ramp. Welp Harbor traffic, Beaver 524 Alpha clear off 290 to the right, Welp Harbor. Alright, as I'm uh, taxiing back to the ramp, I can. Um, let you know that there will be quite a bit of sources in the description of the video. Uh, there are a lot of things I have neglected to uh, to discuss because I just didn't have any natural place for it to come up. So I'm going to attach a document that I made uh, with notes for this video that might give you some uh, clues as to uh, what kind of things you can think about uh, when uh, starting to uh, learn to do a tail dragger. Also, I have found a bunch of fantastic videos from some very, very good uh, tail dragger teachers online. And um, some of them I've watched uh, maybe a dozen times because it, they contain such a wealth of information and um, so many good demonstrations of, of how uh, the tail dragger will behave and how you can um, compensate for that behavior uh, if needed. And um, I ju I'm just uh, astounded by the fact that uh, these real life tips can be used in the simulator uh, with great effect. So for example, the uh, uh, adverse yaw uh, that I've been discussing, the fact that that actually works in the simulator, uh, I'm still blown away by that. Let's see if I can hit that mark there. Uh, oh, that's probably a bit too early. Yep. So now I'm too close to the taxiway. Oh, no! Ugh, the engine died. Uh, I'm going to leave it there so that uh, the people who are suffering from um, OCD can have a nice view of my lovely parking. I have to do a special shout out to uh, the makers of this fantastic plane. This is the de Havilland DHC2 Beaver by Thranda absolute masterpiece of a plane. It's such a beautiful plane, so well modeled and so much fun to fly. Um, it benefits from having the reality and expansion pack by Simcoders, which makes it uh, persistent and to have a lot of damage modeling and uh, the walk around features and all of that, uh, all those goodies. Um, so all in all, this is a fan it's my all time favorite plane. It's just a dream plan for me. And uh, the simulator is X-Plane 12. 
And um, this airport is to Sierra Niner, uh, Willapa Harbor. The town of Willapa Harbor is uh, right here. This is uh, in uh, West Washington. Um, and um, this airport is actually a um, freeware um, airport found on the uh, explain.org uh, download section. Fantastically well made uh, airport. Very beautiful. Uh, if you have any questions, just uh, fire away in the comments or come see me on Twitch at beaver 524 Alpha, uh, Or you can find me in various uh, discords. Um, one of the, my homes is the Piled Edge Discord. So uh, fire away any questions and uh, I may or may not be able to answer them. So thanks for watching and uh, good night and good Here is some further reading or some materials that I've used to learn a lot about what I was just talking about. So the video that I found most instructive is Tailwheels and Crosswinds. That's, this is part one uh, of two. Um, this is on the Martin Pauli's um, YouTube channel with Doug Rosendahl uh, explaining how uh, tail draggers work. That video, it's about yeah, 29 minutes. Um, maybe I've watched it eight, ten times. It's absolutely wonderful. They cover so much ground, and I learned so much from it. Uh, so uh, that, I cannot recommend that video enough. Go watch that. Uh, it's going to be uh, the link is going to be in the de description. Another video is uh, Damien Del Geizo's Tailwheel 101. Which basically sounds like what I'm doing here, but uh, this is uh, much more professional. And um, you see a proper ground school uh, with some demonstration flights in uh, various planes Piper Cub, Boeing Stearman, things like that. A really, really cool video, and uh, you can learn a lot from it. Um, when trying to find a way to describe and explain gyroscopic precession, I really couldn't find anything that made it possible for me to explain it which basically means that I don't really understand it you know as Einstein says if you cannot explain something to someone who don't know it then you probably don't understand it yourself um, anyway I tried and uh, Veritasium has a fantastic short three four minute video on gyroscope precession uh, demonstrating it with a wheel um, and showing how powerful it is really instructive and uh, very interesting but uh, you should probably go watch it and see if you can understand it and if you can try to explain it to me because it's just outside my understanding I can understand how it works but why it does it's a little bit beyond me and surprisingly actually this seven minute video from Dyer TBM goes through all of these left turning tendencies uh, with the um, with the planes and very very well produced and explained um, actually some of these um, principles of flight videos uh, from the Dyer TBM are absolutely fantastic uh, really instructive and good stuff so uh, worth going to watch it uh, even if it's uh, not a piston prop it's uh, very powerful propeller plane which has the same uh, problems apart from it not being a tail dragger that would have been fun though a TBM tail dragger uh, another source is uh, stick and rudder by uh, Wolfgang Langweiche this is a classic work from uh, I think it's from the uh, late 40s uh, and you'd think it would be you know, stuffy and boring uh, and it's but it's not it's He's easy to read and uh, actually quite funny, and uh, it's very down to earth. It doesn't, uh, it's not pretentious. It's really, um, you know, it feels like you're having a conversation with someone, and, uh, and they're kind of trying to avoid being too academic about it. They're trying to, you know, give you the practical details of actually how to do it instead of just explaining this is how it is, you know, you find it out. 
I also compiled a document with some uh, notes that I used while filming this. And uh, I will attach it. It's uh, just rough notes about uh, how, you know, the various elements that I talked about. And uh, it may or may not be useful, but it, it might actually be a way of starting to think about how to, um, to start practicing uh, tailwheel flying. So all of this will be in the description and uh, hope you can uh, make use of it. No, no, no. Fuck! Beavers. Gotta love them. <laughs>